Mayor, thank you for joining us. Um, you know, this is one of my favorite subjects because it doesn't get the attention it deserves. We know we're living in a great moment for renewables. We know we've seen extraordinary advances in energy efficiency over the last generation. And we know that on both fronts, California has been at the forefront of change literally for decades, since the 1970s. The question we're here to focus on today is whether the benefits of all of those advances are being felt in all communities, particularly low-income communities. And, if they are, short answer is no. and the short answer is no. <laughs> and, and if they are not, how to ensure that the answer moves more toward yes. Let me start by uh, uh, something that happened earlier this year, which was that you joined with the mayor of San Francisco and four other West Coast cities uh, to uh, work together on an agreement to try to reduce greenhouse emissions and fight uh, climate change. I want to ask you, how much opportunity do cities have through their own levers to affect the way energy is produced and consumed and carbon emissions, uh, uh, the trajectory of carbon emissions within their own borders? You know, we have tremendous uh, power. And in fact, um, the world is not going to achieve the climate change goals that it's set for itself without cities leading the way. Mm -hmm. And we know that globally, more and more people are moving to cities, so they've become more important. Um, it was very exciting to be part of the local leadership circle in Paris uh, at COP21. And there was a day of the city where more than 500 mayors from around the world came together. And that's what a lot of people said was different in this COP, was the role of the subnationals, yes. the cities, the states. Uh, we really were uh, looked at as the people that are going to make this happen. What are some of the common strategies that you see emerging in cities, either just the West Coast cities or more broadly in the, in the, in the larger group that you referenced in Paris? Well, I mean, we have several levers of power. We have design uh, re and regulatory authorities. And the way that we design our cities is going to lead to car dependence or car independence, mm -hmm. which is a huge piece of the equation. We have our own practices and our own purchases that we do. And then we have things, and, and I'm looking forward to getting into the equity yes, part of the right. conversation, things like job training um, and things like uh, green building codes. And that can obviously push uh, in a lot of direction the types of energy goals that we've let, got. Let, let's go to the equity question, because as, as we've both, as we've mentioned, I mean, California really has been at the forefront of all of these issues for decades. The very first appliance efficiency standards before the nation had them, Jerry Brown imposed them as governor as a way of avoiding building, opening a new nuclear power plant. Uh, decoupling of utilities in the 1970s, uh, renewal portfolio standards, and just a whole progression of uh, uh, policies that literally trace back decades, which we'll, we'll actually show on the monitor a little later. Um, but the question is, uh, how do you ensure that lower income communities, whether it's on renewables or efficiency or ca controlling carbon emissions, how do you ensure that they receive a reasonable portion of the benefits of the advances that are undoubtedly underway? Well, that is something that Oakland is really uh, committed to leading in. And we were very honored to receive a Kresge grant where we're really going to be working uh, with seven other cities to really lift up the equity possibilities with this new economy and also with the work that we mm. must do to save the planet. And there are two opportunities. Uh, one is jobs and one is health. Uh, and recognizing that low-income communities of color have been unduly impacted by the poor choices that have been made in the past, the damaging land use choices. And so as we enter into this moment of correcting for these past mistakes, we have to ensure that the first set of benefits go to these communities and that we look for opportunities as we're creating a whole new economy that those jobs are going to low-income communities. So let's talk about the job side, then we'll talk about the health side. On the job side, what are some of the ways that you think are, are, are the best mechanisms to try to bring some of that employment? Because it certainly has been a point of tension at points, I mean, kind of in the broad uh, environmental community about whether uh, the, the green economy is reaching, in fact, into all communities. Well, one of my favorite examples in Oakland is for 12 years we've been working with Cal Yes. And what's great about this program is they hire every summer youth, uh, high school youth or disconnected transitional age youth, and actually train them to do energy audits, to go into homes in the neighborhoods that they grew up in, their own communities, do energy audits, and em empower those residents 
to figure out ways to not just save energy, but to actually reduce their energy costs. That's not just giving these young people an actual skill, but it's actually empowering them to benefit their very own communities. Uh, they also partner with uh, Rising Sun, a great nonprofit. Not only do they help with the training for that program, but they also are training formerly incarcerated people uh, to do the solar panel installations. And you're going to hear later today from a great organization that's headquartered in Oakland, Grid Alternative, mm -hmm. that also provides that top type of job training to ensure that the jobs of this new economy are going to the people that have been left behind in the past. Let's talk about a little more broadly. I mean, certainly the Bay Area broadly defined is at the epicenter of the clean energy revolution in terms of the amount of venture capital that is invested anywhere in the world and the next 10 reports show just how much of it is concentrated here. The opportunities that that creates, not only at kind of the weatherization level or the installation level, but at the you know, design level and the, and, the, um, and the engineering level, how relevant is any of that today to the kids moving through your public schools in Oakland? Well, I believe it's very relevant, and I get teased sometimes for using this term techquity, mm -hmm. but this idea that we have to um, really instill a sense <clears throat> of obligation with the new companies that are profiting so much in this region to, in, to make sure that they are proactively training the next generation of workers instead of having to always import talent from other countries um, and also apologize for the lack of diversity in their workforces. Mm -hmm. I have a great future diverse workforce sitting ready and hungry for knowledge in Oakland, California. And so part of Techquity is this challenge to the tech sector to really help uh, build the skills in our young people to take advantage of these jobs. And in Oakland, the clean and green tech sector is a huge part of our local economy. Just in Oakland, we have 7,000 jobs mm -hmm. in that sector. Yeah. So uh, we're talking a little about the job side. Let me turn around to the other side, the consumer side, because I think one of the challenges when you talk about uh, extending the benefits of the, of the energy revolution to lower income communities, uh, one of the challenges is that many of them are renters. In Oakland, the census tells us 60% of all your households are renters. And, and many cities are grappling with the question of how do you create incentives for landlords who can simply pass through utility costs to make the um, upgrades that would allow uh, you know, uh, uh, families to reduce their energy burden, their energy bills. Um, have you found any ways of working with landlords to try to upgrade those facilities as well as the, the homeowners who are you know, kind of doing it on their own dime to make their own dime, save yeah. their own dime? We are grappling also. <laughs> and uh, the elimination of redevelopment as a funding source for us has created a mm. challenge. Although cap and trade is a a new resource. But you know this issue of, um, for example, I was sharing with yeah. you earlier, we just changed our garbage contract. And it's fantastic. It's one of the biggest drivers of our greenhouse gas reduction uh, accomplishments. Um, it's fantastic. But it also created a tremendous increase in the rent. Mm -hmm. And our ability to limit a landlord's um, uh, ability to pass that increased cost on to struggling tenants. And let me tell you, Oakland, California is the epicenter of the affordability crisis. There is no city in America that saw a bigger increase in the cost of living uh, versus the, the actual increase in incomes. Uh, in America, we, we are it. And so that uh, has been a hard nut for us to crack, particularly because the state of California has put tremendous limitations on cities as far as the extent to which we can enact rent control. You know, this is, this is one place. This is, these are very co complex issues when you're talk, talking about development patterns and land use patterns and the relationship between affordability and kind of environmental awareness. Many mayors uh, now see promoting more dense development, particularly along mass transit lines, as one way to reduce energy usage uh, and, and greenhouse emissions and also to promote economic development. That's certainly been a theme you've talked about. What are the advantages? of that kind of development? Oh, well, we have got to get away from our car dependence. Um, the, the world depends on it. Um, but it is true that as we uh, look for things like, you know, we push really hard for cap and trade dollars mm -hmm. to help us densify housing, especially affordable housing, near good public transportation. We've changed our zoning rules in Oakland to, again, encourage that type of development 
and limit the parking space requirements. Again, that's a power that the city holds mm -hmm. to get people out of their cars. At the same time, in Oakland, that development is creating great fears and yes. real damage from right. displacement and gentrification. Right, so how do you balance density and diversity? What are some of the levers to ensure that more density doesn't simply mean more displacement and less diversity? Well, one of the things that we're pushing on is anti-displacement policies. And so in Oakland, we are really um, expanding the reach of just cause eviction protections. Uh, we are going as strong as we can under California law around rent control. Um, these are the types of policies that we have to have strongly in place to ensure that these improvements and this development doesn't cause displacement. Um, and I was really pleased recently to get uh, my colleagues on MTC, which is our Regional Transportation Commission, and I can, mm -hmm. I can talk another yeah. time about, yes. I think, the failures of mm -hmm. regional planning, and part of why we're in the mess that we're in in the Bay Area is failure uh, of regional planning. But we just were able to tie um, a reward system for receiving transportation dollars to the enactment of anti-displacement policies. And so we really are trying to create an awareness. And while there was not the political will for regulations, we now are incentivizing following these types of practices and tying it to funding. Is, um, I, we've talked about the efficiency side, we talked about the development side on the solar side, uh, which obviously is an important part of the energy mix in California. But again, the issue of how do you extend that to lower income households, many of whom are renters. Is community solar part of your vision of how the, how the city controls its carbon emissions going forward? Yeah, well, there are two things that I think the Bay Area is famous for. One, uh, you know, Berkeley was kind of the birthplace Pace. of PACE, mm -hmm. uh, allowing people to put the cost for solar and other energy efficiency upgrades mm -hmm. and even drought um, serving uh, improvements onto their property tax bill. I think that was a great innovation mm -hmm. that came out of Berkeley. Uh, a young man named Cisco DeVries, uh, mm -hmm. smart guy. Um, and then, of course, uh, the solar industry in Oakland is extremely right. important to us as mm -hmm. well. Now, um, you've um, made another big, well, actually, let me, let me table that for a second, actually, uh, on, this, on this. The state did your predecessor, Jerry Brown, um, uh, as, as he likes to call himself, um, uh, did reach an agreement with the legislature on spending cap and trade revenue uh, from the cap and trade auctions. Uh, are you satisfied with, uh, do you have an indication of what that will mean for some of the funding that you want in terms of promoting uh, changing development patterns or uh, are you satisfied with the way the state is gonna be spending that money? Um, you know, I think there always can be more. Um, and, you know, of course, there's still a lot of fight about the high-speed rail. It's, mm -hmm. it's been uh, one of the issues. But the idea that we now have this money so that we can incentivize other good behaviors like the adoption of uh, anti-displacement policies and really provide in the wake of the elimination of redevelopment a funding source to densify and particularly to expand the amount of affordable mm -hmm. housing. That is something that this Bay Area needs because the market rate housing is unattainable for the average working family. Yeah. One of the most dramatic things, and I'm bringing the audience for questions in a moment, but one of the most dramatic things you've done about energy is effectively banning coal uh, exports from your from your ports, isn't that writing off good paying jobs? Oh no, not no. at all. <laughs> that is something I was very clear about and I'm really proud that, I don't know if everyone fully appreciates all the work and the tremendous pressure uh, environment that we were under in taking what I am really proud to say was a, uh, a very principled stand uh, against coal. And really, thank you. <laughs> and really making the statement that no human being should ever have to choose between their health and a job, and that that's a false choice. And frankly, the coal industry is a dying industry. Uh, we know that the number of jobs in coal is less than, it's a fraction of even just the solar energy jobs just in California. It really um, is becoming a thing of the past. If we had allowed that coal terminal to go through in Oakland, California, the burning of that coal in other parts of the world would have created three times as much pollution as 
is emitted in all of Oakland, California. Well, let, me, let, let me ask you kind of the, 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 the follow-up question, which is what you've done, is a pro as I've written, is a process that's happening up and down the West Coast. I mean, we see courts, you know, local governments deciding they're not going to export coal. Coal is still a legal product. Are you not, in effect, signing a death warrant for an industry in Montana and Wyoming and Colorado uh, without a national policy that says that coal, you know, that we should be banning the export of coal? But is, cities, it, is this a decision to be made by sit individual cities on the West Coast? Cities need to lead all the time. Look at the minimum wage issue. Cities got just mm. sick and tired of their people being underpaid, non-living mm. wages. And so city by city, we took it upon yeah. ourselves, something that shouldn't be done at the local level. We raised the minimum wage city by city. And finally this year, the state of California woke up and enacted a $15 minimum wage legislatively, yay. Yeah. So uh, th th that's the kind of thing that cities have to do. We are there to push our state and federal governments because we don't have time to be mired in the ridiculous partisan gridlock mm -hmm. that they seem to uh, you know, be paying attention to. We live in these communities. We breathe the air next to the Port of Oakland. And so, uh, as I like to say, you know, mayors, we belong to the, the party of get shit done. <laughs> That's the GSD party. Um, all right, let's go to the audience. We have a couple of microphones. We have a question right up here. Hi, I'm Rosanna Francescato, and I work at one of the local uh, clean energy companies, my domino startup here in Oakland. And I'm really interested in the question you asked about community solar. I know that you know this is a, a tricky thing for a mayor because although I, I agree cities are really important and have a lot of power, uh, you really need a good statewide policy and we've had trouble getting that. So how do you feel about community choice aggregation as a possibility? Uh, I know there's a lot, there are a lot of cities in California moving to them. There's a lot of push for that in Alameda County and that's something that would allow more people, low income people and renters to participate. So Oakland is an active participant in a countywide effort where we are actively making the plans to move towards community choice aggregation. And we know that while the statewide goals are to have 33% of renewables by 2020, we believe if we had community choice aggregation, we could be at 50% renewables by 2020, a much more aggressive goal that's absolutely achievable. But again, I just have to say, I, I'm kind of sick and tired of cities having to go into businesses that really the state and federal government should be doing on their own. And so like the minimum wage, like banning coal, it really is a frustration that once again, cities are getting into a business when we have a lot of other responsibility. Um, so, but that is happening in Oakland um, and I, it is well on its way to being a reality. Um, and you know, back to the equity yeah. question, which I, I wanna try and stay on, we believe community choice aggregation in Oakland would create about 1,800 great local union jobs. Hmm. One more question from the audience. Over here. Oh, okay. I'm Elizabeth McCarthy with California Current. I have two quick questions. One is the 7,000 jobs you talked about, are they prevailing wage? And the other question is, as far as the cap and trade allocation that was just approved, how much is Oakland seeking of that amount? So I'm gonna tell you, I don't know the exact answers to your questions. I hope you find that a refreshing answer from a politician. I don't know. So I don't know if all 7,000 of those jobs are prevailing wage. I would assume they are. I mean, clean and green tech jobs tend to be very good, well-paying jobs. They're sophisticated. Um, again, my concern is that our kids are getting the type of support and skills so that they can move into those jobs. And then with regard to the current um, cap and trade, uh, I know that we did very well in the last round. Um, I don't remember the exact number because sometimes it's not just the city that's putting forth the applications. We work with a lot of different other um, nonprofit affordable housing developers in those application processes. Yeah. So I know that that is going to be a significant source for us, particularly in the light of redevelopment elimination. And I'll also say that we have two measures on the ballot, measure KK in Oakland and measure A1 in Alameda County. Both of those would create, uh, would issue bonds for affordable housing 
And that is going to really help make us more competitive for cap and trade because one of the criteria they look for is local matching dollars. You know, Mayor, it's not only politicians. I've often said the only three words you can't say on television are I don't know. So um, I, I was uh, impressed you say. Can I ask a, fi a, fi a final question, uh, a kind of a summary question? Which is, you, you, you noted something before, you know, that, and you framed it, I think, very well, that you have this burgeoning tech and clean, and clean tech industry here in the Bay Area that often goes around the world looking for a diverse workforce. And when you say, look, I have a potential workforce for you here that needs to be channeled into the opportunity you are creating, one thing you didn't say is, how receptive are they to that message? Ah, you know, um, <laughs> uh, you know, tech companies uh, are growing very quickly. They have a lot of pressure, so you definitely have to get their attention. But tech companies are also run often by very decent people. And I'll just say Mark Benioff of Salesforce mm -hmm. has just been um, a godsend to Oakland. And he's very visionary in how he thinks about his responsibilities. Uh, I'm sure you heard the announcement yesterday. He hired a chief equality yes. officer. Yeah. I think we all need to commend him. And I appreciate he actually needles and pushes others in his industry uh, to really step up and take the responsibility that they have. And so uh, I just want to commend, you know, you need to push both from the outside and the inside uh, to, to get those changes. You know, I had a fairly well publicized letter to Uber mm -hmm. when they announced their moving into Oakland. And, you know, it, it's a little bit of pressure, but it's also help. So, for example, we introduced Uber to Red Bay Coffee, which is an African-American owned coffee company started in Oakland. It's a workers collective and it employs almost exclusively formerly incarcerated workers. Well, we all know software engineers mm -hmm. need to drink coffee. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, a marriage made in heaven. Yeah. Uh, they entered into a contract with Red Bay, and that single contract created 20 new jobs at Red Bay Coffee. Um, but we had to do that introduction. We had to be the, the yenta yeah. of the relationship. Well, you have, given us, you have given us a lot to think about, and I think you framed our conversation in all the right parameters. So you join me in thanking the mayor for being with us here this morning. Thank you.